young protesters seem to think they've got nothing to lose. And faced with what they see as excessive brutality from the police, they're more and more ready to use violence themselves. If China trying to get this place, you have to fight for it. Sure, there are some political problems, but um, I would say that protecting our culture is the most important thing for us. What are you prepared to do to defend your culture? I would say that violence is kind of a symbol to say that Hong Kong's people started to wake up. For the past 10 years, wages in Hong Kong have been stagnant, while rents have increased 300%. But the official demands of the anti-government movement are all about Beijing. They seem divorced from issues of economic inequality. The uh, demands of this group certainly aren't dealing with many of the problems that those of us in America who also uh, are opposed to the worst ravages of capitalism would recognize as real problems. And then two, you see who they're meeting with. Are progressive people anywhere in the world, you know, climbing over one another to be meeting with the Republican high command? So I think that even though there are certainly valid grievances for people to be on the street, this movement is not really about that. It's about a broader attempt to promote really a form of dismembering of China. In fact, the single largest labor organization in Hong Kong is actually against this protest movement. It's called the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. The original movement has been eroded. Now, it's just about opposition to the Chinese government. Now, it's the Hong just about Kong opposition to the Chinese and subversion of state the Hong power. Kong local it's a color revolution. When it comes to inequality, Hong Kong is not alone. Oxfam says that 82% of the wealth created on Earth in 2017 went to the world's richest 1%. This kind of growing poverty worldwide creates conditions ripe for unrest and unfortunately sets the stage for foreign forces to co-opt these sentiments. Welcome to Pride Hong Kong! There were protests in Hong Kong today, but not the kind the city has got used to. First, the Pride rally, spreading the message of love and diversity. The riot paparazzi were at a loss. It all seemed to be too good to be true. And even though hugs were on offer, no one really seemed to be in the mood. Off to the other protest, also not the kind the city had expected. Open the road, they're shouting. A battle not between the police and the protesters, but between the protesters and the people. This woman was trying to keep the two sides apart. This was a citizen's effort to clear the road, to remove the barricades and the arsenal of bricks assembled by the protesters for use against the police. But the mood was ugly, and the scene was an unsettling insight into the fractured soul of Hong Kong. The youth in Hong Kong are facing the same issues as the youth in the West. Rising cost of housing, diminishing job opportunities. But why are the youth in Hong Kong railing against Beijing, who doesn't control the Hong Kong economy? Although there seems to have been a conscious choice to brand this surge of protests as a leaderless movement, individuals, political parties, and organizations are giving this movement its direction. And U.S. officials and organizations are openly colluding with this opposition. At the center of this controversy is a man named Jimmy Lai. His media company owns one of Hong Kong's most widely read publications, Apple Daily. As protests were heating up this summer, Lai went to Washington, D.C. and met with U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton. He was also hosted by the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, a neoconservative think tank that hosts a board of advisors that include two former CIA directors. Then in August, Lai was seen meeting in Hong Kong with a man named Christian Whiten, who worked at the U.S. State Department under both the Bush and Trump administrations. Here's Whiten on a podcast later that month. Causing this crisis for the Chinese Communist Party, for the government, um, at a time when we're, uh, frankly, at a difficult point in negotiations. This is good for U.S. national interest. Also present at this meeting was Mark Simon, Jimmy Lai's so-called right-hand man, who's an ex-Navy SEAL with ties to the CIA, although he says he's not a spy. Under fire themselves, Hong Kongers incensed by their failure to stop last Sunday's UN long attack. A 
accusations of police collusion with the triad strenuously denied. 10 p.m. and die-hard activists now trapped on the station platform were aiming fire hoses down the escalators of police. This is the shocking violence that triggered today's protest, meted out by masked men wearing white. 45 people ended up in hospital. Today, Hong Kong's men and women in black were out in force, defiant in the face of a threat from China just this week that the People's Liberation Army could be deployed to defuse this situation. We're probably touching Beijing's boundaries, but we're not afraid of that. Are you really prepared to suffer the consequences of a crackdown by Beijing if it loses patience? We're well aware of what happened in Tiananmen Square, and I believe a lot of people here are actually more than prepared for, you know, in case of an invasion by the PLA. Uh, obviously, we know what might that lead to, but if we die, Hong Kong will die with us. That's our stance. If we burn, Hong Kong burns with us. Tens of thousands of pro-democracy protesters converged on Yuan Long in searing heat despite the ban. Their chanting denounced tyranny. Colorful epithets were directed at the local police chief. Free Hong Kong, they shouted. Reclaim Yuan Long from the triads. Another slogan, well, more of a stretch. Another curious figure in the anti-government movement is Martin Lee, who was present at this August meeting as well. He's the founding chairman of Hong Kong's Democratic Party, the largest pan-democratic party, the clique of political parties in Hong Kong that's been called anti-China. Their policy basically is anti-China, and they do things which are really hurtful to the overall public interest of Hong Kong. The pan-democrats would go on to win 7 in 10 votes that November in Hong Kong's local elections, but Beijing says that the opposition and its young agitators were stopping people from going to the ballot box. Martin Lee's connections to Washington go back decades. As the current protest movement was heating up, Lee also took a Washington and met with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Lee is the recipient of a number of awards from U.S. institutions, including a 1997 Democracy Award from the National Endowment for Democracy. Although the NED is technically an NGO, it has received millions of dollars from the U.S. State Department, and critics of the NED point to the fact that one of its former presidents said it was created to continue the work of the CIA without the CIA's stigma. Additionally, NED co-founder Alan Weinstein admitted that a lot of what the endowment does today was done covertly in the past by the CIA. I asked Lee about his party's alleged ties to the U.S. government. We have been very careful. We don't take overseas uh, donations uh, because that's not allowed with any foreign political party or political group. It may be illegal for a party to take money from a foreign government, but from a foreign non-governmental organization, that's another story. That's not illegal. You know, definitely. There are gray areas, you know. Uh, an NGO, you know, um, giving money in the course of promoting de democracy, there's nothing we can do about it. There's also nothing to be done about donations from individuals. Individuals like Jimmy Lai, who donated to the Hong Kong pan-democratic camp to the tune of millions. Then there's Joshua Wong, who appears in the press as a leader of this protest movement. Wong became the face of the anti-China movement in Hong Kong several years ago, and both he and Martin Lee have been honored by Freedom House, a subsidiary of the NED. Wong has met with Nancy Pelosi, Marco Rubio, and was most recently spotted meeting with a U.S. State Department official in July. The protesters call it fire magic. The authorities call it terrorism. But who would have thought just a few months ago that the words Molotov cocktail and tear gas would become part of Hong Kong's daily vocabulary? This was a scene overnight at the Polytechnic University, the last campus still occupied by the protesters. The police are over there, they've just moved into that position, firing tear gas, and the protesters are over there firing back with Molotov cocktails, you can see them burning on the road. The question is, will the police actually now try and storm the campus? Because as we saw the other day, there are thousands of Molotov cocktails and tens of thousands of bricks, as well as bow and arrows waiting for them, so it could be really nasty. 
Inside, the halls of learning have been turned into ramparts, echoing with the call to arms. Close the gates, he commands. He might as well have said, pull up the drawbridge and man the umbrella ramparts. The humble umbrella has morphed into something almost unrecognizable here. And the same can be said for the revolution that bears its name. This may be a 21st century place of learning, but this is all very medieval. You've got your archers here. You've got the makeshift catapults over there. And the message board is having a hard time catching up with the actual events. It is easy to forget that this whole movement started with peaceful mass rallies against an ill-judged extradition law. But with no leadership amongst the students, bad leadership from the authorities, and no dialogue between the two, Hong Kong is paralyzed and paying the price. It's all about that tunnel there to central Hong Kong, which has been cut off for the last few days. And in order to open that tunnel, you need to open the National Endowment for Democracy takes U.S. taxpayer money. It literally funds foreign political parties. It gives training to people who end up, you know, going on violent rampages through the country. It literally funds the salaries of foreign politicians. It brings them over to meet with Mike Pompeo. Uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, along with USAID, which is more closely tied to the U.S. government, they're, they're completely and fully responsible uh, for keeping these uh, protests alive and keeping the lifeblood of money flowing through countries uh, that the U.S. wants to overthrow. And it's quite curious that Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, a known conservative, has joined the protesters in Hong Kong. And what's even more curious is that in Mr. Cruz's own Texas, you've had police shoot black citizens in their homes, and yet we have not seen Senator Cruz join the massive protests against police misconduct against citizens that he's sworn to represent. The U.S. is seeking to strike China through its soft underbelly. Uh, the U.S. is in interested in destabilizing China because they believe that they'll get an advantage. They're afraid of the rise of China as a global power. You know, the U.S. worldwide strategy is to, again, to prevent uh, the rise of any rivals. And so we'll expend uh, no limit of money to try to prevent that. So why is the U.S. supporting and... It's kind of road to death. You have to be dying to be prepared, right? These students will be middle-aged when this 50-year handover finally ends. They'll probably be thinking about their own kids. Will they be on the barricades? Or will China have won this long, unequal battle for the heart and soul of Hong Kong? In the midst of this crisis, a powerful Hong Kong identity is being forged. Unless something really changes, that's going to be a problem for China for years. The anti-government movement in Hong Kong well, maybe we should take a look at what's been actualized by this movement so far. Both the House and the Senate have approved their version of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Let's take a closer look at exactly what this law would do. The Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act claims to support the democratic aspirations of Hong Kongers. This has been a great bipartisan moment on the floor of the Senate. But what it really does is lay the groundwork for further U.S. sanctions and intervention. For one thing, the bill cites the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a treaty that China has yet to ratify. That means it's not legally binding under international law. The bill also cites Hong Kong Basic Law 45, the provision of Hong Kong's law that states that the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage. The United States says it wants Hong Kong to follow Basic Law 45. But any examination of Basic Law 45 reveals that implementing such universal suffrage should be done in light of the actual situation in Hong Kong. Still, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act threatens to punish China if it doesn't accelerate this timeline. The bill also threatens sanctions if Hong Kong does follow Hong Kong Basic Law. It says the U.S. will sanction Hong Kong if the Hong Kong government enacts a new law regarding national security pursuant to Article 23 of Basic Law. 
Article 23 of Basic Law gives Hong Kong the authority to prohibit acts of treason and subversion against China. It also prevents foreign police from conducting political activities and Hong Kong political parties from establishing ties with foreign political parties. Additionally, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act mandates the president to make a list of people for the U.S. to blacklist from entering the country. It gives the U.S. the authority to seize the assets of anyone on this list, Chinese or otherwise. And anyone who tries to get around the U.S. confiscating their possessions can be fined by up to a million U.S. dollars. It's for this reason the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act has been called a money grab. What's more, the bill states that protesters in Hong Kong won't have any problems getting U.S. visas regardless of what crimes may have been committed. An earlier version only guaranteed U.S. visas to peaceful protesters, but that's now changed. Sonny Jurong spent much of the summer lobbying for this bill, and it's he who's credited with amending this bill so that the word peaceful was removed. In the previous um, version, um, it mentioned that only peaceful protester can have the right to um, um, apply for the U.S. visa. And now that uh, sentence is um, uh, deleted, and now it generally came that um, all the protesters who are politically motivated and unfortunately got crim a criminal record can also apply for the U.S. visa. Why is Congress proactively informing Hong Kong citizens that they can get a U.S. visa regardless of what crimes have been committed? Why is Congress trying to punish China for violating a treaty that isn't legally binding? And Hong Kong for enacting its own laws? Why is this bill trying to force China to accelerate its own timeline for granting Hong Kong universal suffrage when no timeline is provided by Hong Kong basic law? And why does Congress want to allow foreign influence in Hong Kong? What is the aim of this sanctions vote? It really is an effort to totally sabotage Hong Kong. Demonstrators, they're not demanding democracy. Imagine, they're demanding sanctions on their own city. Sanctions everywhere in the world is economic warfare and it's strangulation. Why on earth would anyone in Hong Kong make a demand that sanctions be passed on Hong Kong? There is an agenda. They may not be aware. These are young people without a future. Uh, and that, that's because of what has been imposed on them from the West. You know, in the late 90s, the U.S. passed the uh, Iraq Freedom Act, the Syria Freedom Act, the Libya Liberation Act, what legislation like... Well, behind me you're seeing really uh, the, so the city slowly coming back to life, but there are plenty of scars uh, that I can show you right now. Uh, for example, uh, we've moved on since uh, government installations or offices and police stations being attacked. We've seen over the weekend now pro-China businesses as well as companies linked to China uh, have also been defaced. I'm standing in front of the frontage of the Shanghai Commercial Bank where it has been vandalized uh, by protesters. Uh, on the street levels here you can see uh, metal rods, uh, fires being set uh, on say, uh, 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 during the protest. Remember, Wan Chai was one of the hot spots. Next to me here, businesses are still up and running again. We have people here at this restaurant preparing breakfast uh, for the people. But the other thing that I really wanted to show you uh, is further down here, which is uh, a Starbucks branch. Remember, uh, Maxime's, one of the biggest list uh, catering groups, actually uh, runs the Starbucks franchise. But because the founder, as uh, daughter of Maxime's, had actually appeared on uh, national TV uh, criticizing the protesters, uh, all Maxime's chains, including the Starbucks branch, for example, have also been vandalized and targeted. And uh, as you can see, buses, uh, trains are back to normal, so it does look like the city is slowly coming back to life, but we may be expecting further actions by protesters later this evening. Or if this is meant to do is to establish a baseline upon which to build until you get further and further down the road of U.S. intervention and sanctions. The Chinese economy has been growing three times faster than the United States for the last 30 years. The standard of living of the average Chinese worker has been growing much, much faster than anything that the average American worker experiences. The Chinese have figured out 
how to do the thing that is the most urgent need of the people of this world, which is to stop being poor and to become comfortable and to have a modern industrial economy. They are doing that. They are the ascending power in the world. Everybody knows that, and that means they challenge the United States because our dominance, the dominance of the United States, which has been in existence roughly a century, is now heading down. The Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act is now law. Beijing may soon send in troops to act as peacekeepers to make sure the city doesn't destroy itself. But in Hong Kong, tourists have disappeared. The city's economy is grinding to a halt. Against the backdrop of an unprecedented economic war between a now dominant United States and a rising China, Hong Kong's future hangs in the balance. totalitarian government the protester with a loud head of shouts at the people below. This is an extraordinary scene. Neighbours but also alumni from the University of Hong Kong which is up there reclaiming their neighbourhood by dismantling the barricades, getting rid of the bricks, all the time keeping an eye, that's why we're wearing the helmets, on that bridge up there where some of the protesters are still gathered in defiance, threatening to throw rocks on us down here. Seconds later, a small group of protesters and citizens go after each other. Tensions have boiled over in a city on the edge of a nervous breakdown, caught between sympathy for the protesters' cause and revulsion at many of the methods. If they are peacefully protesting, that is fine, but they are now using all sorts of violence. Okay. That is not acceptable to us. So you're trying to clear the road. There's a yeah. major hospital up there. Yeah. Ambulances can't go up the road. So yeah. They're getting stuck in traffic jams all the way around the corner. Yeah. So this is the neighborhood basically reclaiming its neighborhood, essentially. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So that buses and transport can flow, mm -hmm. MTR can open, people can get to work, to school, to university if they want to study. Yeah. Have you lost all sympathy for the protests? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Those neighbours not taking part are gripped by scenes they probably thought they would never witness. Wondering what kind of divisions lie in store for Hong Kong. It's hard to remember that this has started off with an extradition bill um, a long time ago. And where's it going to end? Is this a turning point, do you think? Is this a turning point against the demonstrations this week? This week? This what we're seeing here? I don't necessarily think so. Well, you can see the determination of the neighbours here to try and get rid of these barricades in the middle of the road to reopen the neighbourhood and this road for business. The question is whether the events of the last few days, the violence that we've seen and now this backlash are a turning point in this whole business. What did you say, sorry? We love Hong Kong, right. that's all. We want our home to be peaceful and with love, like before. The first vehicle on the cleared road, an ambulance, earning a round of applause. Over on the other side of Victoria Harbour, a small piece of history was happening. The People's Liberation Army deployed out of their barracks for the first time since the beginning of the protest. In t-shirts, not uniforms, carrying buckets, not guns. The clever PR message, we're here to help. The implied warning, we will clean this mess up if you can't. And next time, it might not be with buckets and brooms. Mac Fry, Channel 4 News, Hong Kong.